Hello, this is the Guardian 996. In this video, I'm going to explain how to prove that Jesus Christ is God the Son, that is, equal to God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. This video is going to be a lot longer than any of the other videos I have uploaded thus far, because it is designed to be exhaustive. This video is going to explain three very important views that people have about Jesus concerning two very important concepts that will determine whether or not what they believe is true or false and whether their views of Jesus are valid or invalid. The views we will look at are as follows. Jesus Christ is not God and he wasn't guilty of blasphemy neither did he say or do things that would have been tantamount to blasphemy. Jesus Christ is not God and he was guilty of blasphemy and finally, Jesus Christ is God, and he wasn't guilty of blasphemy. So why are these views important? Whether or not Jesus Christ is the Son of God, equal to God the Father, hinges upon these views. If Jesus is guilty of blasphemy, he cannot be God. If Jesus is guilty of blasphemy, he deserved to die by crucifixion. If Jesus is guilty of blasphemy, he would have been lying and or insane or crazy. If Jesus isn't guilty of blasphemy and said certain things about himself that can be applied to God, he would have to be God himself also. If Jesus is God, he cannot be guilty of blasphemy or lying. He would have to be sinless. If any of the above points cannot be reconciled properly, then a double standard or special pleading fallacy will result if there is no logical and empirical room for an exception in any of these scenarios. If a religious system has the wrong identity for Jesus Christ, then any gospel message would also be wrong as well. Thus both their view of Jesus would have to be rejected as well as their gospel message. See Galatians 1, 6-9. Other reasons why these views are important are as follows. In order for the views of religions of either Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, Muslims, and Jews to be valid, they have to agree with both the Old and New Testaments in the Bible, meaning the Jews in the Old Testament and the Christians in the New Testament, especially the Hebrew Jewish Christians, would have to be able to agree and ascribe to the views of the ab above mentioned religions based on what the Bible says about them. If any of the above religions disagree in any part of the Bible, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, it doesn't make any difference, concerning whether or not Jesus was guilty of blasphemy as well as whether or not he is God, then they must be rejected. On a side note, Judaism is essentially the Old Testament of the Bible, but the Jews reject the New Testament and the Gospels. Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and Seventh-day Adventists believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but there are issues about who Jesus is. Muslims do not believe Jesus is God's Son, neither do they believe that Jesus Christ is God himself. For Muslims, this is considered to be an unforgivable sin and blasphemy called the shirk. This happens when people ascribe partners to God and or claim that God had a son. This will be discussed later on in the presentation. The Jews do not believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God or the Jewish Messiah. If the foundational truth of who Jesus Christ actually is happens to be wrong, then the whole religion and theology of that religion must also be rejected. Under Jewish Mosaic law, the Jews only believed in one God. If they spoke the names of other gods, they would not only be acknowledging their existence, but they would also essentially be giving credence to their existence and power. Exodus 23.13 forbade even the mentioning of other gods' names, so it would only be natural that it would be unlawful to even so much as acknowledge or give credence to another god's existence and power. This bullet and all its points will be discussed in more detail later on in the presentation. For now, this is just a backdrop and background to set the stage. Violating 
Exodus 23.13 would be a violation of the first and the second of the Ten Commandments, which is a sin called idolatry. Ultimately, someone or a group of people must either be lying, ignorant, or crazy concerning the details about who Jesus was or who Jesus claimed to be. Unless it can be proven which of the three views mentioned before are correct, there will always be a disagreement about who Jesus was or it and is. When there is a division over this issue, other religions are formed as a result. While we're not here to bash or disrespect anyone or their beliefs for that matter, the point is to see if there is an absolute truth about who Jesus actually is. On a side note, because there is divi there's division over this issue, and because there are other religions that have formed as a result of this division, these other religions and these divisions are actually what cause confusion even further concerning who Jesus actually is. The three views mentioned on slide two are, are the only possible views that we can look at. It would be unthinkable and even preposterous to consider a fourth view that would say Jesus is God and is guilty of blasphemy. Since that would not only be an oxymoron, but it's also po impossible for God himself to blaspheme and lie. Since the Jews only believed in one God, when they weren't participating in pagan culture and the pagan rites, they defined blasphemy as speaking contemptuously about the one true God or usurping his position, authority, titles, power, and attributes, etc. Blasphemy was so serious it required the death penalty by stoning. Because of this, and because the Bible records that Jesus was accused of allegations of blasphemy, we need to investigate why and what it all means. I mentioned a double standard fallacy before, so I'm going to define it for clarity. A double standard or special pleading can be defined as applying a standard to another person or situation that is different from a standard applied to oneself or a different situation. Some examples are below. Another way of defining a double standard is judging two situations by different standards when in fact you should be using the same standard. This is used in argumentation to unfairly support or reject an argument. Special pleading is a form of fallacious argument that involves an attempt to cite something as an exception to a generally accepted rule, principle, etc. without justifying or being able to properly and logically justify the exception. A double standard can also be defined as a situation in which two people, groups, situations, etc are treated very differently from each other in a way that is unfair to one of them. It is also defined as a set of principles that applies differently and usually more rigorously to one group of people in, or circumstances than to another, especially like a code of morals that applies more severe standards of sexual behavior to women than to men. It is also a misleading argument that presents one point or phase as if it covered the entire question or argument at issue. A double standard is also a self-contradicting or self-refuting situation or statement that people try to make a justification for an exception where there is no room for one according to the evidence and or logic. If correctly identified, a double standard is viewed negatively as it usually indicates the presence of hypocritical, biased, and or unfair attitudes leading to unjust behaviors and views. So now we're going to look at the first view from slide number two. The view that Jesus is not God and he wasn't guilty of blasphemy. The circumstances required for both of these conditions to be true are as follows. Jesus could never have said or done anything that would have been tantamount to blasphemy and or the seriousness of it thereof. Some examples are, Jesus could never have healed anyone as is recorded he did. Jesus could never have forgiven anyone's sins. And Jesus could never have said anything that the Jews, that is the Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, lawyers, and those skilled in the law of Moses would have interpreted as blasphemy. That is, either claiming to be God, his deity, 
his character, attributes, authority, rights, privileges, prerogatives, sovereignty, etc., that belong to God as his, that is, claiming them as Jesus' own. The problems with this view are the Bible records Jesus doing things and being recorded of being accused of, the, of blasphemy by the Jews. When Jesus heals a paralytic in Matthew 9, 1-8, through 8, Mark 2, 1-12, and Luke 5, 17-26, uh, they immediately accuse Jesus of blasphemy when he forgives the paralytic's sins. It is also important to note that the New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses also shows that the Jews accused Jesus of blasphemy in these passages. In John 8, Jesus makes a claim saying, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I am is a reference to Exodus 3.14 in the burning bush where it is written, And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. When Jesus uses the words I am with such emphasis, he is essentially claiming God's name from Exodus 3.14 as his own. This is why in John 8.59 the Jews take up stones to stone him since they knew what he was claiming uh, the, uh, when he, what he, they knew what he was claiming when he said the words I am. that is to be God, and thus accusing him of blasphemy without saying so, and thus by stoning him, sentencing him to death. See Exodus 3, 13-14 for the context of God's name. In Exodus 3, 13, Moses asks what God's name is when he sends Moses to free the Israelites. A similar situation happens in John 10. Jesus said in John 10:30, I and my Father are one. Immediately the Jews took up stones again to stone Jesus, and Jesus asks why they seek to stone him. The Jews say, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. See John 10.30-39. Again, the New World Translation accuses Jesus of blasphemy, despite in the same verse uh, claiming that Jesus is making himself a God in that translation, instead of making himself God, as other translations would use. If Jesus was making himself a God, this would be idolatry, a violation of Exodus 23.13, which would entail a violation of the first and the second of the Ten Commandments. Mormonism has a similar problem when they refer to Elohim, or Yahweh, that is, Heavenly Father, and Jesus Christ, Jehovah, as separate gods that were once men before attaining godhood in addition to claiming that we as mankind can attain godhood. More problems with view number one are if Jesus made himself a god he would be guilty of idolatry which is a reproach to God himself as well. This again violates the first and the second of the Ten Commandments but setting oneself as a God or claiming to be the God is also blasphemy since there is only one God. See Mark 12:28 through 34, Deuteronomy 4:39, Deuteronomy 6:4 through 5, Isaiah 44:8, Isaiah 45:14, Isaiah 45:22, Isaiah 46:9, and 1 Corinthians 8:6. But the most obvious places where Jesus was accused of blasphemy are in Matthew 26, 57 through 68, and Mark 53, I mean Mark 11, 14, 53 through 65. In Matthew 26, 64, and Mark 14, 62, Jesus responds after being asked if he is the Christ, the Son of the Most High God. He says, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power, and coming on the clouds of heaven. That's Matthew 26:64. He also said in another place, I am. 
and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. That's from Mark 14.62. Immediately after Jesus says these things in these verses, the high priest tears his clothes and says, He has spoken blasphemy. What further do we have what further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. That's in Matthew twenty six sixty five. And once again, even the New World Translation uses the word blasphemy in these passages to show what Jesus is accused of. So if they're accusing him of blasphemy, they can only be possible if Jesus claimed to be the one true God and not simply a God. So the conclusion on view number one is, given the text and the references we've looked at so far, we can safely conclude that view number one, that Jesus Christ is not God and he wasn't guilty of blasphemy, neither did he do or say things that would have been tantamount to blasphemy, cannot be true since we see that Jesus was accused of blasphemy on several accounts. The Jews accused Jesus of blasphemy because he said and did things that the Jews could have and did interpret as tantamount to blasphemy. Since Jesus did do and say things that would have been tantamount to blasphemy, we have to reject this idea that Jesus Christ is not God and he wasn't guilty of blasphemy, neither did he say or do things that would have been tantamount to blasphemy. If we try to make an exception to why both points in view number one can both be true at the same time, despite evidence clearly demonstrating the contrary, we would be guilty of a double standard fallacy or special pleading fallacy. If we are guilty of that fallacy, then we cannot accept view number one as true either. So view number two, Jesus Christ is not God and he was guilty of blasphemy. In the previous view, we explored situations where Jesus could clearly be guilty of blasphemy if he wasn't God himself. So let's assume that the Jews were right about Jesus not being God. If you also believe that Jesus Christ isn't God, then you essentially agree with the Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and the lawyers, that Jesus isn't God. If you believe this and agree with this, to be consistent with your view, you must also agree that Jesus is guilty of blasphemy as well. We have clearly seen that Jesus was accused of blasphemy from these people in the Bible. There is no denying that Jesus said and did things that would have been tantamount to blasphemy. So if Jesus isn't God, yet he did and said things uh, that he is recorded of saying and doing, then he would have been guilty of blasphemy if he was just a mere man. If Jesus was just a mere man and not God himself, and he said and did these things tantamount to blasphemy, then you must also agree that Jesus Christ was guilty of blasphemy and, de and thus deserving of death by crucifixion. Otherwise, you commit the double standard special pleading fallacy since there are no other options that are available here. So the problems with view number two are if Jesus was indeed guilty of blasphemy, then Jesus and the Bible are lying about what Jesus said and did. It would also mean that the Jews were right in what they said and did about as well as to Jesus. This would render the entire rest of the New Testament invalid. It would also render much of the Gospel accounts invalid as well. This means that other than historic Jewish texts, we have no idea who Jesus was, what he said, or what he did, or anything that happened after Jesus was even born. If only the Old Testament is still valid for the sake of the Jewish point of view on Jesus, then we are still waiting for a Messiah or a Savior to come, and therefore no one can be saved from death, judgment, sin, hell, etc. That would mean we are still dead in our trespasses and sins. That also means that Jesus could not have been resurrected, neither could he have ascended back to heaven to be with God, because he would have been guilty of sin. It also means we have no hope of salvation or resurrection of any kind whatsoever. If a Messiah or Savior has yet to come, then that leaves the question, who is the Antichrist that is mentioned in the New Testament, especially in the letter of 1st John in the book of Revelation. Further, if Jesus Christ isn't God and he, if he isn't the Messiah, then how can we be saved? God only accepts his own righteousness as payment for sin. 
This means you have to be morally perfect in thought, word, and deed. No one has ever lived. No one that has ever lived has ever been able to meet that requirement. If Jesus was guilty of blasphemy and or idolatry, then not even Jesus could fulfill that requirement. Therefore, Jesus would have died in vain. No one can ever be morally perfect in thought, word, and deed, and without and without a Messiah or Savior that can fulfill those necessary requirements, our sin will never be paid for, ever. It also means no one can go to heaven or be resurrected ever either. If a person believes Jesus is guilty of blasphemy and is not God himself, such a person is justifying oneself in his or her own sinfulness while trying to earn his or her own way to heaven. But God will not be bribed or mocked. See Isaiah 64, 6 and Galatians 6, 7 through 8. He will not be bribed because he is the judge of the universe. He will by no means clear the guilty. A fine must be paid either by a Messiah or in the death of the sinner his or herself. See Exodus 3, uh, 34, 7 and Numbers 14, 18. So the conclusion on view number 2. If Jesus Christ is not God, and, guilt, and yet guilty of blasphemy, we cannot trust him or be saved by him. If Jesus Christ is not God, and is guilty of blasphemy, he deserved to be crucified. If you believe Jesus Christ is not God, and is guilty of blasphemy, not only do you agree with the Jews, but you also bear the weight of your own guilt since you would have had him crucified if you lived back then. Can you live with and bear that guilt for the rest of your life? Or is it unthinkable or preposterous for you to entertain or even consider such a notion to agree with the Jews and have Jesus Christ crucified because of blasphemy charges? Either Jesus and the Bible, specifically in the Gospels and the New Testament, had to be lying about who Jesus was, or the Jews had to be lying, if it is true that Jesus is not God and was guilty of blasphemy. However, blasphemy was so serious that it required the death penalty by stoning. Because of this, the Jews needed empirical evidence uh, to be brought by the witnesses who heard a person blasphemy. Lying is also an abomination to the Lord. He killed a husband and wife in Acts 5 for lying to the Holy Spirit. And surely, lying about blasphemy had to be just as serious, if not more than just lying. It was not a thing to be taken lightly. However, there were plenty of witnesses present needed to accuse Jesus of allegations of blasphemy. If you cannot bear the weight of said guilt above, or it seems to be unthinkable and preposterous to entertain or consider such a notion, and you still seek uh, hope of salvation and resurrection, this view that Jesus Christ is not God and uh, guilty of blasphemy must be rejected also. There is also no way around these implications without committing the double standard fallacy. So now we're going to look at the third and final view here. That is, Jesus Christ is God and he wasn't guilty of blasphemy. In the previous views, we have seen that Jesus said and did things that could have been tantamount to blasphemy. There was only one way Jesus could be innocent of blasphemy allegations and yet said and did the things he said and did in the Bible. That is, Jesus Christ is God the Son of God the Father. God the Father is God, Jesus Christ the Son of God is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. They are different persons in the Godhead, but each one is by nature God and possesses all the same attributes and equality. This will be discussed later on in the, in the presentation. You can't make such claims and do such things that God can do unless you are God himself. Also, if you attempt to do so, you would essentially be usurping God's position, authority, character, power, sovereignty, rights, prerogatives, and even his name. This is blasphemy. Jesus could not be a God or another God because not only is this polytheism, that is, the belief in or worship of more than one God, but it is also a violation of Exodus 23.13 to refer to other gods by name, acknowledge their existence, and or even give credence to their existence and power. 
A violation of Exodus 23.13 is also a violation of the first and the second of the Ten Commandments, which is a sin called idolatry, as mentioned before. When biblical Christians talk about the Trinity, that is, one God in three persons, they do not mean one God in three gods, or three persons in one person, or three persons in three gods, or one person in three gods. What biblical Christians do mean by the Trinity is one God in three persons. This means that we believe the Father is God, the first person of the Trinity. It also means we believe Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is, is God, the second person of the Trinity. We also believe the Holy Spirit is God, the third person of the Trinity. A common misconception and misunderstanding is that biblical Christians believe in three separate gods. This is not true. Biblical Christians only believe in one God. God is not one plus one plus one equals three, but rather God is one times one times one equals one. This is because the Bible gives three distinct persons the name of God. This will be discussed more later on. Angels are created beings, just as humans are created beings. But Jesus has two natures. God and man. If an angel said and did what Jesus did, it would be blasphemy on the part of the angel. Here are three good sources I recommend to help answer any questions or speculation or skepticism on the subject of the Trinity. These are not exactly exhaustive, but basically they help to explain what people believe about the Trinity, the names of God, and also some of the information can, uh, can be found here in this pamphlet called Christianity, Cults, and Religions. This allows you to compare and contrast the different religions of the world with biblical Christianity and the Bible. You can find these and more of them at www.hendricksonrose.com. The next slides will show some compelling proof pictures that give proof that God the Father and Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and God the Son share the same names, titles, attributes, privileges, and prerogatives. So here we have a chart that gives the deity of Jesus. And if you look closely at each of these names, Yahweh, which means I am, God, Alpha and Omega, which means first and last, Lord, Savior, King, Judge, and Light. All of these are used to refer to the Father and Jesus. And in this chart, there are numerous amounts of scriptures where this is actually done. This is the second page of the chart. Once again, there are multiple occasions where God the Son and God the Father are both referred to by these titles and names. Rock, Redeemer, Our Righteousness, Husband, Shepherd, Creator, Giver of Life, Forgiver of Sin, Lord our Healer, Omnipresent, and Omniscient. Once again, these are applied to both the Father and Jesus. And all of these references in this chart will help prove that. This is the final page of the chart, and again, this is giving three. Uh, this is giving several different names for the Father and Jesus, as well as titles and references. God is omnipotent. This is applied to the Father and Jesus, preexistent, eternal, immutable, receiver of worship, hope, speaker with a divine authority. Who raised Jesus from the dead? And who gets the glory? All of these things are answered in all of these scripture references. It's also important to know that in the case of Thus saith the Lord, used in the Old Testament, 
this is used by the prophets on many occasions when the prophets are speaking directly from God. The, the prophets were re representing God back in the Old Testament, just as the apostles represented God in the New Testament. However, when pointing to the, uh, to the references, this is used many, many times by the prophets. Now here's another important point to make, in case any Muslims may have any questions. Since the Quran tells us to obey the Bible in Surah 568, a problem arises for the Muslim because the Bible disagrees with the Quran about the fate of Jesus. The New Testament written by eyewitnesses says Jesus rose from the dead, but the Quran, which was written 600 years later, says Jesus didn't die or rise from the dead. So if the Quran is right about the fate of Jesus, it's wrong to tell us to obey the Bible. If it's wrong about the fate of Jesus, then it's right to tell us to obey the Bible. Either way, uh, there is a serious problem for the Quran when you think about it. That's quoted by Dr. Frank Turek. This would pose a serious threat and double standard to Islam right here alone. More of this will be discussed later about Islam in the videos at the end of this presentation. The final point I would like to demonstrate uh, is how uh, I would like to demonstrate how to reconcile who Jesus is with Jews and Judaism. Isaiah 53 is a chapter that specifically addresses the things that will happen to the Messiah and what he will do. We will listen to it play audibly. As you listen to it, if you're Jewish, ask yourself if there is anyone in all of Jewish history that either fulfilled these prophecies in this chapter or that any of the descriptions given in this chapter can be applied to anyone in all of Jewish history. Isaiah chapter 53 Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now I'm going to explain the Godhead as revealed in the Bible. Earlier on I was talking about the Trinity. I have two versions of a symbol here that represent the Trinity and help to explain it better. In the middle of each of these pictures, in the center, is God in the inner circle. Now each of these points of this triangle 
around and from which the circle sur the bigger circle surrounds the points of the triangle are represented by the circles at the uh, at the ends of the triangle's sides in this case we're talking we're saying the father is not the son the son is not the holy spirit and the holy spirit is not the son but if you notice also there are other uh, points coming off of the three outer circles. In this case, we see that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Similarly, the bigger one shows the same thing. The Father is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. And yet, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. So here is the conclusion on the whole matter. If any doctrine or religion teaches that Jesus Christ is not God the Son, they ultimately either end up with a double standard or they wind up believing he was guilty of blasphemy, and so were his followers and disciples for that matter. And thus they are saying Jesus and his disciples were worthy of death, and in Jesus' case he was worthy of death by crucifixion. However, if we are to say Jesus isn't guilty of blasphemy despite having done things that were tantamount to blasphemy as far as the Jews were concerned, Jesus would have to be God the Son. So if we accept that Jesus Christ is God the Son, any theological system, doctrines, or religions that deny the deity of Jesus and the doctrine of the Trinity slash triune Godhead for that matter must be rejected. Also, considering that every doctrine or religion that believes in the creator God of the Bible, but denies the deity of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, with the exception of Judaism, all came well after Jesus Christ died and rose again, and well after the early church disciples died. What I mean by this is, Judaism came before Christianity, but all the other world religions were written and founded well after the Bible had already been written and well after Jesus had died and rose again, whereas Judaism came before Jesus' death, and Jesus fulfilled Judaism. Because the accounts claim that Jesus isn't God, these sources came from, uh, these came from sources well after Jesus' life. They could not have been first-hand witnesses of what happened back then. Neither can they confirm the records by this test of being first-hand witnesses. Therefore, these creeds, doctrines, theologies, and religions must also be rejected. Judaism is rejected because, according to the New Testament and Isaiah 53, plus all the other prophecies concerning Jesus, were fulfilled by Jesus Christ himself. And because of this, the Old Testament and Old Covenant is basically fulfilled and done away with. Because of this, Judaism is no longer valid today as of the beginning of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Since the Jews of Jesus' day and the disciples' day would not have interpreted the Old Testament books in the way that Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, and Muslims would, this is yet another reason to reject these religions and their doctrines. Lastly, I have one final set of charts that gives the description of messianic prophecies. This is primarily for the benefit of the Jews. I'm not going to read through all of these. Instead, I will leave it up here for a few moments so that if you want to take a look at them, you can read them for yourself, and even if you need to, you can pause the video to look at them and get a better glimpse at them. But basically, it gives the prophecy right here in the following, in the following verses, after explaining what's happening in those verses, and then it gives the fulfillment of when Jesus fulfilled them. Like the charts before, some of these will have the text cut off from above and below. Like the one at the top of here has it, but at the same time, you can always rewind a few seconds backwards to take a look at them and reread it again. Anyway, I hope this has been a very good help for you. If you like this video, please like, 
share and subscribe to the channel. After the, uh, this uh, chart disappears, there will be some videos that will help explain what I talked about a little bit more thoroughly. Thank you for watching. If God, if Jesus is God himself, Jesus dying, wouldn't that um, nullify the attributes of God? No, that because that his human nature died, not his divine nature. In fact, that's an excellent question. Let's just give just a couple of minutes on this because I've talked to imams about the Trinity mm -hmm. and um, they had a very different definition of the Trinity than Christians have. The Trinity is three persons in one nature. So here you have one divine nature mm -hmm. uh, in this triangle, and obviously you have three corners in the triangle, so you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in one divine nature. The Son, Jesus, also has a human nature. These two natures don't intermingle. Uh, so when Jesus died, God didn't God die, died. Okay. right? Uh, so this human nature is perfect. And so when he lives a perfect life in our place and takes punishment, he's not suffering punishment for his sins. He didn't have any. He's suffering punishment for our sins. Hmm. And so when we trust in him, then we can be saved. So the imams I spoke to thought that the Trinity was God having sex with Mary yielding Jesus. That's not the, the biblical view of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. And so whenever you, you ask a question about Jesus, you actually always have to add, answer, or ask two questions. In fact, let's look at it this way. God is one what, but he has three who's, whereas Jesus is one who with two what's. So whenever you're asking a question about who two, you've got to ask which what are you talking about. Are you talking about what one or what two mm -hmm. when you're talking about who two? This is the Abbott and Costello theology here. The point here is, is that people will say, how could Jesus be God? Um, and not know when he was coming back. Well, did Jesus know when he was coming back as God? Yes. Did he know when he was coming back as man? No. Did Jesus get hungry as God? No. As man? Yes. Did Jesus die as God? No. As man? Yes. Jesus has two natures, and those two natures uh, answer a lot of the problems that people often have with the Trinity. If you understand he has two natures, then those questions make more sense. When you're saying that there is a human side and uh, a divine side of Jesus. Was God always a human or did he become a human? Because no, he added humanity to his deity, but that addition did not intermingle with his divine nature. So wouldn't that mean that God at one point in time was lacking something? No, it meant because he's perfect. He doesn't lack anything. He just didn't have a human nature prior to Jesus. Jesus didn't exist as a human. He existed as the second person of the Trinity, but he didn't exist as, uh, as a human. Now this is similar to Islam mm -hmm. in this sense, because the, the, as you know, the prime sin in Islam is shirk. That's putting mm -hmm. partners with God, but Islam actually does that, because okay. Islam believes that Allah is eternal and so is the Quran. Those are two different things. Mm -hmm. So Islam is saying that I have a God and I also have something else that exists eternally, a book. Whereas Christianity says God is eternal and this human nature comes into existence one thousand, or just over 2,000 years ago, or just under 2,000 years ago. Actually, just over 2,000 years ago, excuse me. <laughs> I'm getting my dates all wrong here. Okay. Song of Solomon, mm -hmm. chapter 5, verse 15. Mm -hmm. I think it's it, the Prophet Muhammad's name is in it. It has the Prophet Muhammad's name in a Hebrew. Uh, uh, translation of it. When it's translated into English, his name is translated to altogether lovely. So I guess my question would be, why was it translated to altogether lovely? And if Muhammad's name is in the Bible, why don't Christians recognize that and look towards the Quran for answers or to see if there is some truth in the Quran? Okay. Oh. First of all, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, and I haven't translated that passage, so I don't know. Um, what does the word Muhammad mean? It means the praise one or like spirit of truth. Okay, spirit of truth. So you're saying spirit of truth is in the Song of Solomon? No, it's translated as, to, as altogether lovely. Okay. But if you look at the verse in Hebrew, it has his name, Muhammad. It's, it's not 
Uh, I'd have to I'd song. have to look that up. I don't know. So um, it's, uh, I, I believe it's uh, Songs of Solomon, chapter five, verse. Okay. 15. Well, Song of Solomon, as you know, was written at about a thousand B.C. Muhammad was born in in 570 A.D. Mm -hmm. So there's a 1500 year gap there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's a coincidence. I don't know if it's the same person. I don't know if it's translated right. I'd have to look it up. But uh, to your second question with regard to the Quran, well, there's a lot of truth in the Quran, just like there's a lot of truth in many other religious writings. Mm -hmm. But the the main difference, well, there's several differences as you know the main difference well there's several differences but let's just talk about Jesus for a second okay mm -hmm. um, Jesus is said to have risen from the dead we've been through some of the evidence here the documents that say that were written in the first century by people who were there and other people who checked it out like Luke the Quran comes along as you know written after Muhammad dies in 632 AD I should go this way because that's forward for you 632 AD and in Surah 4, verse 157, it says that Jesus didn't even die, much less rose from the dead. Mm. He was taken straight to heaven. Maybe somebody like Judas was put in his place on the cross. Okay. Now, for Christians and for people that look at the evidence, my question would be, why would you take a document written over 600 years later to tell you what happened when you have documents that were written by the eyewitnesses who were there and also these documents say that he rose from the dead and if he rose from the dead that better explains the spread of the church out of Jerusalem at that time why would you take a document written so much later the other problem it seems to me is that if you look at Surah 5 verse 68 I think it is mm -hmm. it says "O ye people of the book ye have no ground to stand on unless you stand on the law and the gospel in other words uh, Allah is telling the believers uh, of Judaism and Christianity to obey the Old Testament and the New Testament, the law and the Gospels. Well, when that was written in the 600s AD, we already knew what the law and the Gospels said. We have entire Bibles from the 300s AD. Mm -hmm. Now, some Muslims will say, well, we can't trust the New Testament because it's been corrupted. Well, if that's the case, why is the Quran telling us to trust the New Testament? We know it hasn't been corrupted from Muhammad's time on. Mm -hmm. um, so basically the problem here is, is the Quran tells us to obey the New Testament, but the New Testament leaves us no room for the Quran.
Now let's zoom in and take a closer look at what the Watchtower teaches about Jesus Christ. The Jehovah's Witnesses, when they talk to you at the door, are going to tell you that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're going to use very high language about him. What you need to understand is they do not believe that he's truly deity. They do not believe he truly rose from the dead in the way of a true resurrection. He was resurrected only as a spirit. There was nothing physical about the resurrection. And what's more important is Jesus Christ is the first and greatest thing that Jehovah God created. In fact, according to the Watchtower Society, Jesus is the only thing that Jehovah God directly alone created and then through him created all other things. Jehovah's Witnesses is a fascinating uh, system of thought. Again, it takes away from the authority of the scriptures, although it will say to you it is affirming the scriptures. The principal denial in the doctrine of the Jehovah's Witnesses is the divinity of Jesus Christ himself. And they take the verse in the beginning, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. And they do that on the basis that they say that in the original Greek there is no definite article there. It's called the anathros usage. There is no definite article. If it, there were a definite article, it would say, and therefore in the beginning was the God. But they say since there's no the out there, therefore it has to be a God. If you go down the first chapter of John, somewhere in verses 17 and 18, the Father himself is referred to without the definite article. So are they going to make him also a God? The, the use of the language is very uh, f plagued with uh, linguistic trickery. They use language with tricks, of the original Greek, which the Greek scholars themselves would not actually subscribe to. Then they talk about 12,000 from 12 tribes, 144,000 entering into this eternal realm and all of that. It is one messed up system of an eternal realm. I believe where uh, Jehovah's Witnesses went wrong, is in their failure to accept the divinity of Jesus Christ. Once they removed the divinity of Jesus Christ, the very authority of the Old Testament was now suspect because whose authority did we go on for the Old Testament ultimately but Christ himself. So it is again a cult. What is a cult? A cult is that which claims to be based on the historic Christian truth but actually deviates in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So it is cultic in that sense and wrong in its final source of authority. Jesus never claimed to be God. Everything he said about himself indicates that he did not consider himself equal to God in any way. Jesus was created by God. They identified Jesus as Michael the Archangel. Michael the Archangel, the greatest of all of God's created things and the master worker through whom all the rest of creation is made. He is only a spirit, and then that spirit ceased to exist when Jesus was born on earth. Because according to the Watchtower Society, men do not possess a spirit. And so Michael ceases to exist, through whom all things have been made. Jesus exists for 33 years. He dies, and Michael is recreated in heaven. And so the person that they look up to as Jesus is actually Michael the earth. Michael the Great Prince is none other than Jesus Christ himself. That's what the Watchtower teaches about Jesus. Let's now compare that to God's Word. When you look at all of what the Bible says about Jesus Christ, not just portions of it, but all of what the Bible says about Jesus Christ, there are numerous streams of evidence that demonstrate that Jesus Christ is the God-man. We can't just pick and choose what we're going to look at, look at in the New Testament. We have to let all of Scripture speak. When we do that, we see that Jesus Christ truly was man. He truly became flesh. In John 1.14, the Word, which in John 1.1 1, 1, had eternally existed and was in His nature, God, became flesh. Flesh, that which we can touch and hold. Some of the earliest heresies in the church were people who not, did not deny that Jesus was God. They denied he had ever truly become man. John is very concerned about that. So there's all sorts of evidences that Jesus truly became one of us. He entered into human flesh. Now today, 
what you have is most people denying not that aspect of the biblical revelation. They'll say Jesus was just a man. They'll deny the deity of Christ, as various groups do. Where do you go to find evidence of that? Well, you have all the references where Jesus is called God. John 1.1. 1, 1. You have John 20.28, 20, where Thomas says, My Lord and my God. You have Titus 2.13 and 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the term God is used of Christ. Romans 9.5 is another that, that is possibly applying that very same term to Jesus. But beyond that, you have all sorts of other evidences of the deity of Christ. You have the fact that in Colossians chapter 1, he is described as the creator of all things, not all other things, as the New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses puts it, but he creates all things. If you're the creator, you yourself are not a created being. In Philippians chapter 2, it is said that he has eternally shared the very nature of God, but did not regard that equality he had with the Father something to be grasped or held on to but laid that aside and took on the form of man in Philippians chapter 2. You have all these evidences, and then there's a, a tremendous uh, testimony from the Gospel of John. He is called the I Am, and that the, the I Am verses in, in, in John 8.58, before Abraham was, I Am. He told the Jews in John 8.24, unless you believe that I Am, you will die in your sins. When the soldiers come to take him in the garden, when he says, I am, they fall back upon the ground. John couldn't make it any more plain than that. And while that does go back to Exodus 3.14 and the burning bush, it's even more closely connected to the very same phraseology used in Isaiah and in the Minor Prophets as a name for Jehovah God. You have the text that identified Jesus as Jehovah in Hebrews chapter 1, John chapter 12, numerous passages. And then there's that which we Christians tend to unfortunately forget. And that is, there's so many things that Jesus says that's because we are used to reading the Bible. We put them into, into a certain context, but there's so many things he says that no created being could ever say, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Can you imagine Moses saying that? Can you imagine Isaiah saying that? Matthew chapter 11, verse 27, no one knows the Son except the Father. Can you imagine Isaiah saying, I am such a great person that no one knows me except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom He wills to reveal Him. Those would be words of blasphemy on the part of anyone. And so there's this huge amount of information in all the Gospels where Jesus says and does things. No human being who was not the God-man could ever say those words without committing utter blasphemy. And so the testimony of Scripture is, Jesus Christ is the God-man. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon His shoulders, and His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Joseph Smith said, in what's called the King Follett Funeral Discourse, one of his last teachings before uh, he was uh, killed in the Carthage jail. He said, we have imagined and supposed that God has been God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see. When he refuted the idea that God had eternally been God, he forever separated his followers from biblical Christianity. Until Mormonism can repudiate that belief, there is no way that Mormonism can even begin to consider biblical Christianity. And so when we talk about the biblical Jesus, we have to step back and say, first we start with an eternal God, who in Psalm 90 verse 2, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. So when we talk about Jesus being God, when we point to the passages on the deity of Christ, which a Mormon will accept, they believe Jesus is a God. He is the God of the Old Testament, just a different God than Elohim. They have two different gods at that point. We need to emphasize we are talking about an eternal God who created all things, who is not himself created. He is not himself one of the spirits of men. 
Interestingly enough, Mormons believe that Jesus is Jehovah. And yet when you go in the Old Testament, Jehovah creates the spirits of men, Zechariah 12.1. And yet in Mormonism, he is one of the spirits of men. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul, uh, Paul describes Jesus and says that he is the creator of all things. Visible, invisible, principalities, powers, dominions, or authorities, all things created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things exist, consist, hold together. And yet in Mormonism, Jesus obviously was not the one who created the planet that his father lived on when he was a man, or the God before him, or the God before him. And so they have to limit these descriptions of Jesus to just having relevance to this planet. One really starts thinking almost of science fiction when you think about limit, having to limit the truth that Jesus Christ created all things to just this earth so as to leave room for literally an infinite number of gods who create an infinite number of other worlds. Now was Jesus God in human form? Jesus was a God in human form, yes. Just a God, not, not the creator, the eternal God becomes flesh. He is the creator, yes, but he also has a father. You know, as it tells us in John, you know, I will do nothing of myself but what I seeth the Father do. And the Father taught the Savior everything, including how to be the Creator, including how to lay down His life for us so that we can live again. Do you believe God is a body of flesh and bones? Like mine, I do. You think He eats and sleeps? Well, that would be a good question. I would imagine that He would get hungry occasionally, probably a favorite food. Um, we are created in the image of God, we believe, and we have to eat every day and we need nourishment. Therefore, I would imagine that would be true. Do you believe that God has a body of flesh and bones? Absolutely. Um, you know, I... And that's kind of a radical belief, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, too. Um, just in my investigations of, of different beliefs, it is. Um, I believe, you know, if we have a body, why, why would God not have the same thing or, or something better that we would? And I believe that, you know, God has uh, a perfected body that, um, that isn't subject to age or, or pains or aches or anything like that. And uh, far superior to, to what I would enjoy now. But yes, I absolutely believe that. What do you do when the Book of Mormon conflicts with the Bible? I've never found a contradiction between the Book of Mormon and the Bible, to tell the truth. What do you think of that scripture that says, God is not a man, he should lie? God would be... He would never lie to anybody, and God being a former man, we do believe that in our church, and we can become like God if we adhere to, to His commandments and the words of His prophets and apostles on the earth today, and in the Bible, and the Book of Mormon. You say that God is, has, has a body of flesh and bone. What about where Jesus says God is spirit, and they that worship, worship Him must worship Him in spirit and the truth. If God is a spirit, how can He be flesh and bone? What I believe that to mean all we all have within our bodies within our bodies and souls we have these spirits and they um, are like our father in heavens and his son jesus christ's spirits they are clothed in tabernacles tabernacles of flesh we call that a body if that helps your question out as man is god once was as god is man may become so the Mormon Church teaches that God the Father was not always as He is today. He was once a mortal man with a body of flesh and bones, just like ours, who progressed to become a God. According to Mormonism, He lives on a planet that circles a star named Kolob. The Mormon God also is married and has many wives. Together, they had lots of spirit babies, and that's supposedly how you and I got here. According to Mormonism, it's possible to even become a God reigning over your own planet. Do you think you can become a god? I believe I can, deep down. Do you uh, think you'll become a god? Yes, if we live as our Heavenly Father has shown us that example here when He was on Earth, we do have that, that hope. Do you believe that you'll become a god? A god? Yeah, a god. Well, if I, if I live a uh, good enough life, yes. Is that what the Bible says? that you and I can progress and become gods of our own planets and that there are many gods? Of course not. No, the Bible says that God is always the same. He never changes and that there is no God beside Him anywhere. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Thus says the Lord, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. 
Is there a God beside me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. You are my witnesses, says the Lord. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. One of the Mormon prophets coined a phrase, as man is, God once was, and as God is, man may become. You need to understand that in Mormonism you have the eternal law of progression, that men and God are of the same species. We are at different points in our progression and in our exaltation. And so, since we're of the same species, then God, the father of this planet, who they call Elohim, the Hebrew term for God or gods, depending on what verb it's used with, Elohim was once a man who lived on another planet. And he went through a pro process of, of following the gospel there. He was deemed worthy, and when he died, he was resurrected with his wives, organized this world. Notice I did not say created, because the Mormon God cannot create anything ex nihilo, out of nothing or into nothing. He can only organize pre-existing matter. But he organized this earth, and he begets spirit children with his wives. The first begotten of his spirit children was Jehovah, or Jesus. We all are the spirit brothers of Jesus. Each one of us, you and I, we were also begotten by Elohim and one of his heavenly wives in a spiritual pre-existence. Another one of the offspring of Elohim was Lucifer. Is Jesus the spirit brother of Lucifer and you and you and me? Yes. Can you explain that? I don't understand that. Can you explain that to me? Um, it's a hard concept for me. It really is. I mean, when you first, you know, introducing people to the gospel, it's probably not one thing that you're going to jump out and say, hey, guess what? We were, you know, but as far as what we believe, you know, before we came here on earth, we all existed before. We all lived in God's presence. His, his is our fa him is our father, and uh, Jesus Christ is our brother and our other spiritual, you know, everybody here on earth is our spiritual brothers and sisters. That's why when, you know, when you try to look at people, and as far as Christianity in general, you, you treat people as your brother, as your, you in, know. Including Lucifer? You know, and that's a, it's a good question, but yeah, I mean, he was our spiritual brother as far as that goes. He was, we believe in something as far as what happened in heaven that caused him to be where he is now and in the position that he is now and where we are, um, given the bodies that we have and things like that. Lucifer obviously rebelled and was cast out of heaven and therefore was, I mean, it's just, it's almost like a, you know, wayward child type thing, but taken to the extreme. Was Jesus Lucifer's brother? Yes. Okay. And, and as you are his brother. And Lucifer's brother? <laughs> as you are Jesus' brother as well. We're all children of our Heavenly Father. In the pre-mortal spirit life, Jesus, Lucifer, and all of us were the spirit children of God and his wives. So according to Mormonism, Heavenly Father is actually one of many gods, and he and his wives produced many spirit children. One of them was Jesus, then came his brother Lucifer, and then all of us. So they teach that Jesus was not the eternal creator of all things who became a man, as the Bible says. They say he was the brother of a Lucifer who became a man and then became a god. The Bible clearly warns against preaching another Jesus, and that Satan himself can appear to us as an angel of light. Remember what Joseph Smith said. He said it was an angel clothed in light that gave him another testament. According to the Bible, it is crucial that we have the true Jesus and the true gospel. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. I, as a Baha'i, I believe in Jesus Christ. 
And I would say I have never believed in Jesus Christ as much as I have since I'm a Baha'i. Oliver says he believes in Jesus Christ, yet he isn't a Christian. How can this be? The problem is that our friend Oliver has a different Jesus. He's not talking about the Jesus of the Bible. It's kind of like this. If a stranger approaches you and says they know your buddy John, but all their facts about John are wrong, you could safely conclude that they're referring to a different John. Now with that in mind, there are many religions that claim they know and believe in Jesus. But that doesn't mean they're referring to the same Jesus of the Bible. For example, Mormonism believes that Jesus was the spirit brother of Lucifer. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus was Michael the Archangel. That's not in the Bible either. Muslims believe Jesus was just a prophet. That's definitely not what the Bible teaches. And Baha'i teaches Jesus was simply a messenger. Notice how none of these religions teach what the Bible says, that Jesus was God in human flesh. You see, the real Jesus sparked more controversy than any other religious leader in history. He made radical claims. He spoke not from, but with authority. And with that same authority, he forgave people of their sins. He healed without medicine. He fed thousands from one boy's lunch, and he calmed the raging sea. His claims? He claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but through him. He claimed to be the bread of life, the light of the world, the good shepherd, the true vine, and the resurrection and the life. And he was ultimately crucified because he claimed to be God. He was able to conquer death by rising from the grave just as he said he would. How is that? Because he is the Christ, the Savior of the world, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is God incarnate. So. If someone comes to you talking about Jesus, but he doesn't sound like he's talking about the Jesus of the Bible, it's probably because he isn't. Now, what do you think happens after somebody dies? Where do they go? I think they return back to the earth when they came from. Dust? Dust. Is there a heaven? Uh, I believe there is a heaven, but I believe that God only resides in heaven. Do you think there's a hell? I don't believe there's a hell. I don't believe God will torment his people. Who's going to heaven? Nobody's going to heaven. Just God's in heaven? God's in angels. So you've got no hope of, if death seizes on you today, there's no hope of an afterlife, it's all over? I believe in paradise. What do you mean? Paradise on earth, earth would be regenerated back to its original form. You're Jehovah's Witness? Yes, I am. Oh, um, I've got a question for you. There's a knife in my back, I've got three minutes to live. How can I enter the kingdom? What do I have to do? How do you enter the kingdom? Yeah. Uh, well, you had to exercise faith in God. If you've been exercising faith in God, then you have nothing to worry about. I haven't. I've lived a terrible life of fornication and blasphemy and lying and stealing, and then someone stuck a knife in my back. I've got two and a half minutes to live. What do I have to do to enter the kingdom? Well, I'm, I'm sorry for you, man. I don't think you will enter the kingdom. I can't enter the kingdom? What do I have to do? What, what, what would you... Yeah, there's so appreciation for life in general. Yeah, I do. I've got two minutes to say to, to uh, Jehovah, I appreciate life. Well, you know, two minutes and you know, all that time you had when you was fornicating and you committed adultery, you didn't think about God at the time. So why would you think God about God at the time of your two minutes that you had the knife stuck in your back? So what do I have? What, what do you, what's the difference between me and you? Is it just time? You've had time to redeem yourself by doing something? Well, yeah. I, I would say time is, uh, is all we have. That's the only value you have. So if you ain't putting time into what you're doing, then you, you get what, what you reserve. You know? So what are you doing that's different from what I've done? I mean, I haven't done anything. What have you done to merit entering the kingdom? Well, to be honest with you, I'm not too sure I'm going to enter the kingdom. I hope that I will. I have been, been positive towards people. Are you a good person? Yeah, I'm a, I, I think I'm a good person. Well, let me take you through some of the Ten Commandments and see if you are, okay? Have you ever told a lie? Oh, yeah, I have. What do you call someone who tells lies? Uh, an unperfect person. 
Liar? No, I'm perfect. What would you call me if I told lies? I'm a perfect person. Have you ever stolen something? Yes, I have. What do you call someone who steals things? An unperfect person. Have you ever used God's name in vain any time in your life? Yes, I have. Well, that's called blasphemy, where you take God's name and use it as a cuss word. It's very serious. Now, Jesus said, whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Oh, yeah, definitely. So you're a self-admitted, lying, thieving, blasphemous, adulterate heart? <laughs> yeah. And what, what are you going to do to enter the kingdom? How can you wash away all that crime? What, did you ha what do you have to do? Well, you got to ask for forgiveness, for one. For well, why can't I ask for forgiveness? I've got one minute to live, and you're saying I can't do it? Well, you know, I can't tell you what God does make his decision. You know, that's his decision. He's the only all-powerful person who knows who's going to enter and who's not. So. Lamar, remember the thief on the cross that was next to Jesus? He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll, let, you'll, you'll be with me in paradise. He entered the kingdom by grace, through faith. It wasn't of himself. And the reason I can enter God's kingdom in, an, in a second, in a heartbeat, is because it's a free gift of God. For by grace you say, through faith, and that not of yourselves, is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And God can give us everlasting life because Jesus suffered and died on the cross for us, took our punishment. Right. And he rose again on the third day. And what we've got to do is do what that thief did. Repent, turn to Jesus, turn from your sins, and put your faith in him. And, and so why didn't you say that to me when I got one minute to live, you're going to let me die and go to hell? Well, for one thing, sir, I'm not a perfect person. I don't have all the answers. You know what I mean? What I know is what's in my heart, and that's it. Um, be honest well, read the Bible. Set aside the Jehovah's Witness New World Translation and read the Bible, because that says there's nothing you can do to save yourself. It comes as a gift of God. Hey, thanks, Lamar, for talking to me. I've got three minutes to live. I've got a knife in my bag. <laughs> okay, I'm afraid okay. of dying. Yeah. There's a knife in my bag. <gasps> okay. I'm scared of dying. Mm -hmm. I want to go to heaven. Right. What would you tell me? How can you get to heaven? Yeah, I'm dying. I've got two and a half minutes to live. I what tell would you, you say to I me? hope you had a good life. You're being good, so you come to heaven anyway. But I haven't been good. I've lied and stolen. I'm feeling really, really guilty. Yeah, I've me had too. See the church. Yeah. You think they can help? They can I got help. two minutes to live. Yeah, You're going to drag me to the church. I'm lying on the ground. I'm bleeding to death. No, no, no I carry you there. So what would the church say to me? I don't know. That's his job, not my job. Not <laughs> your job. <laughs> so you just say, it's, it's not, not a bad guy too. You'd say, it's <laughs> not my job. I tell you that if you, if you can forgive yourself. Sorry. I forgive myself, but I'm scared of God. I'm scared I've broken God his commandments. God forgives everything. Just, if so he believes us. that you truly are sorry for any wrongdoings you've done in your life. So you could be sharing you. a mansion with Hitler? Uh, possibly, but possibly Hitler has redeemed himself as well. So, so three million, six million Jews, and Hitler says, sorry about that, and God lets them in? To heaven? Well, I believe that everybody's soul goes to a, a place that might be heaven, and it then comes back, and every time you're on the earth, you learn from each life that you live on earth, and then you get reincarnated. So I'm down to, I'm down to one minute, and what, what have I got to do? Nothing at all. Everybody's life is, is a lesson and something, so each life that you live, you learn something and you grow from each life. So you, you believe in reincarnation? Yes, totally. What were you in the last life? I don't quite know. I think I lived in medieval times, actually. And who gives yeah. the new bodies to people? Who's in charge the of it? The soul choose what, what, you, choose a what body, you want. A body is just skin, it's just, yeah. So where do you get the information from? Do you make it up? Um, I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> it's no matter what kind of ritual you do. It's no matter to whom you pray and how you pray. As long as I believe, like yourself, okay, that there is God. There's something above us, something great, something we can understand fully. It is. How okay? can I get to heaven? I'm not Jewish. I'm a Gentile. I've sinned. I've lied and stolen. How can you I am me? not a part of the Jewish religion as it is. Okay? So well, I just believe I in I just God. believe that you... You must be a good person. You must be. I'm a not good... a good person. No, I mean. Do you think you'll go to heaven when you die? Yeah. Why? Why? Yeah. Because I'm a good person. Well, let me ask you some questions. Yeah. See if you're good. Have you ever told a lie? Yeah, of course. What do you call someone who tells lies? Liar. Have you ever stolen something, even if it's small, in your whole life? Mm, maybe. Yeah. What do you call someone who steals things? A thief. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Mm, no. Never once. Probably once. Well, that's called blasphemy. It's using God's name as a cuss word. It's very serious. One to go. Jesus said, if whoever looks at a woman and lusts after her, you desire her sexually, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? 
<laughs> you don't need to say any more. So <laughs> listen to this. By your own admission, you're a lying, thieving, blasphemous, adulterate heart, and you have to face God on Judgment Day. If He judges you by the Ten Commandments on the Day of Judgment, do you think you'd be innocent or guilty? What you thinking about? Lying, thieving, blasphemous, adulterate heart? Yeah, everybody does. That's true. Would you Even go to you, right? Yes, sir. Would you go to heaven or hell? Well, I'd rather choose to go to heaven. You choose to go to heaven, but the Bible says all liars will have their part in the lake but of fire. But he will forgive me, because I've done many good things in my life. Okay, now here's a little thought for you. Try that in the court of law. Say, Judge, I raped that woman. I've done a lot of good things in my work. life. It won't work. It won't work, will it? And it's not going to work with God. He can't be bribed by good works. He knows what I did. Yeah. If God judges you by the Ten Commandments, you'd be guilty on Judgment Day. Is that right? Like me, you'd be guilty. Yeah, I suppose so, but I think God knows that deep down there is good within everybody and he, you know, when, you, when your soul goes to heaven, you get a chance to come back and... Susan, let me give you yourself. one quote from Jesus. Do you know what justifying yourself is? Mm -hmm. Do you know what that means? <laughs> this is what Jesus said of the religious leaders of his time. He said, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly thought of in the sight of man is an abomination in the sight of God. All our good deeds mean nothing to God. It's like a rapist saying to a judge, Judge, I raped that woman, I slit her throat, but I want to tell you, <laughs> I give money to the Red Cross. Just Nobody really knows, do they? Nobody's ever actually been there and yes, physically... Yes, they have. We've got the greatest and... testimony, the testimony of Jesus Christ. He came down from heaven to do the will of God. You can't earn everlasting life by doing something. You can only come by God's gift. But as long as I live good, you have to live good. You're a good liar and a thief. Life. Yeah, I'm not proud of it. Okay. The only thing you can do is call upon the mercy of God. And He can give you mercy because Jesus died in your place. He took your punishment on the cross. Did you know that? When He was on the cross, He was being punished for your sins, for my sins, for the sin of the world. Then He rose from the dead. What you've got to do is repent. Don't just confess your sins to a priest. Go to God and say, God, I'm sorry for my sins. Say, created me a clean heart and then turn from your sin and put your trust in Jesus Christ. The minute you do that, God will forgive you and grant you everlasting life. It can happen in an instant, not even three minutes, because God's ready to accept you if you're ready to repent and ask His forgiveness and trust the Savior.